The Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning in the second chapter, reading verses 8 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, now that Advent is over and you had a good ugly cry after your longest night or blue Christmas service and the candles from the Christmas Eve have cooled, the gifts under the tree are unwrapped and hopefully the last of your Christmas cards will arrive this week. And look, if not, at least you included a Happy New Year wish. Plus, there are 12 days of Christmas. Oh, don't forget that email that I know you've been putting off. And after that, I'd say you're probably due for a long winter's nap or at least a chance to sit down and clear your mind for a few minutes. Speaking of which, when was the last time you had the luxury of a clear mind? Or maybe I should say it another way. When was the last time you went to sleep without a worry? My best guess is around grade school, maybe sometime before my teenage years. I can remember the build up to Christmas used to feel so long. My younger brother and I would watch the Christmas specials on television in our footed pajamas and wet hair from taking our baths. My mom and dad would drive us around town to look at decorations while we ranked our favorites in the neighborhood. Helping my dad deliver groceries to some neighbors a few blocks from our house, singing Christmas carols and putting up nativity sets around the house with my mom, and dinners with my extended family and playing with my cousins in the basement of grandma and grandpa's home are cherished memories. Of course, going to church and dressing up for the Christmas cantata, I know you'll be surprised that I was the angel and my brother was a rowdy shepherd. You know, I recall turning my head when my parents would kiss under the mistletoe and getting my picture with Santa Claus whispering my wish list in his ear. I was a fortunate little kid with a lot of fond memories and thankfully, not too many worries. Well, what is your favorite Christmas memory as a child? Does it include an unforgettable gift or a long-standing tr tradition in your family? Perhaps food's involved. I think there should be food or candy. Yeah, candy! My favorite memory includes a surprise gift that my dad found in the basement from St. Nicholas after we had opened all our presents on Christmas morning. I was so confused when mom called me downstairs, uh, but there was a 
Candy apple red scooter with rubber tires, just like the ones the older kids in the neighborhood rode up and down the street with. It was incredible. It was a gift I didn't ask for, but the ride I always wanted, and I was so, so surprised. Today's familiar passage is also full of surprises, and I'm sure there are many more that await generations of believers who read the Christmas story. And once we're finished unwrapping the gifts from Luke chapter 2, it'll look like the aftermath of children opening presents on Christmas morning. So men, it's time to get your trash bags ready for a whole lot of wrapping paper basketball shots. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? It's an unwritten job description of dads on Christmas Day. They are in charge of consolidating the wrapping paper and taunting family members by moving the garbage bag rim to avoid a swish. I don't make the rules, but I would like to invite you to use your holy imagination as we unwrap the details of the Christmas story that you may have previously overlooked. The birth announcement of Jesus did not come to your social media news feeds with a perfectly lit golden hour Instagram photo complete with the baby's own hashtag and handle, nor did the announcement come to your mailboxes with a series of professional photos of baby Jesus in golden fleece diapers with a matching envelope and a stamp and a Bible verse caption, which I mean, is laudable given the sheer exhaustion of new parents. Nor did the announcement come from the king's courier following a royal trumpet sound and the hear ye, hear ye throughout the land. Nah, the birth announcement of the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords came to a group of third shift shepherds living now, not just camping out, but living in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. It was to these simple men of the fields that God's message first came. Were these the shepherds who supplied temple visitors with unblemished lambs for their ceremonial offerings? I don't know. Maybe. But they were shepherds and they were the first people to put their eyes on the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world even before they knew it. Another interesting gift revealed to the shepherds was the glory of the Lord shining around them that terrified them. In the Old Testament, God's glory refers to God's presence and strength to light the way and to deliver God's people from evil, as Dr. Ruth Ann Reese explains. In Exodus, God's glory destroys Pharaoh's army and then accompanies Moses and the Israelites by a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day, while also providing manna, the bread from heaven, to sustain them on their wilderness wanderings toward the promised land. God's glory also appeared as a consuming fire of holiness on Mount Sinai, and it was God's glory that filled the tabernacle and later the temple, confirming God's presence with God's people. So, when the angel of the Lord appears to the shepherds with the glory of the Lord shining around them, it's a big deal. And frankly, their fear is absolutely appropriate. When the blinding lights of God's glory appear, God is about to intervene. God's glory always foreshadows a culture-shifting phenomenon. And if having a messenger from God escorted by the glory of God wasn't wild enough, suddenly a multitude of heavenly hosts began praising God. This terrifyingly incredible theophany prompts the shepherds to recommission themselves as a search party. We've got to see this they say, and without delay, the shepherds head into the city of David, Bethlehem, the city of bread. I know that shepherds don't scare easily and that livestock farmers don't typically make rash decisions, but has it ever occurred to you that they left their sheep to search for a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a feeding trough? 
who knows, but I highly doubt they brought their entire flock through the city looking for a newborn baby at night. Now, during the day, it's probably okay, but at night, I'm just saying that city officials are definitely getting complaint calls for a stunt like that. I mean, sure, it could be worse. <laughs> they could have brought a drummer boy. The shepherds hightail it looking for the newborn Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. All they know is that he's in a stable and they'll find him lying in a manger. Now, it's a good thing these farmhands know what to look for and listen for. I'm thinking they've narrowed down their search to barns with nightlight candles and distant cries or that distinct sound of rustling hay. I mean, realistically, the longest they're searching is three hours because Jesus will wake up and cry because he's hungry or because he needs a new diaper. And if the shepherds don't hear a crying baby, they just need to listen for a belly aching, cranky father or a mother in pain from or celebrating because the baby finally latched. <laughs> of course, maybe the shepherds are listening to hear the quiet songs of a lullaby. Eventually, the shepherds find Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And they told the proud, fatigued parents what they experienced about the angel, the glory, and the multitude of heavenly hosts. They relayed the message as was given to them by God's messenger. And yet, I wonder what that first pastoral visit was like. We know that all were amazed at what the shepherds told them. And we know that Mary treasured all their words in her heart and pondered them. But when did she know it was real? Did one of the shepherds interrupt the spokesperson to say, no, no, no. The first thing the angel said was, do not be afraid. And then, was it that when she knew that it must be true because the angel greeted her the same way? I imagine a jolt of adrenaline and chill bumps from head to toe coursed over Mary and Joseph when they heard the testimony of the shepherds. I wonder if Joseph asked them where their sheep were. Oh, they're still in the fields. What? Did Mary encourage them to get back to their flock so they wouldn't lose their jobs on her account or so she could finally get some rest before Jesus needed to be fed again? <laughs> Both, maybe? I, I don't know. I bet Mary and Joseph loved telling Jesus about those smelly, searching shepherds who let their flock in order to find him in the middle of the night. Yeah, what a great story. I mean, it's even good enough for an adaptation. Perhaps you've even heard a familiar story, right? Which one of you, having 100 sheep and losing one of them, does not leave 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. That's from Luke chapter 15. Wait, did Jesus reinterpret his birth story to set a foundation for his ministry? Was the sheep lost or was the foolish shepherd searching? We can't know for sure. But my holy imagination can't help but ponder these things. And when the shepherds returned, they glorified and praised God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Can you imagine their conversations on the way back? I mean, I wonder if they made it to the fields before sunrise, before anybody noticed they were gone. Did they wake up from a short night's sleep thinking it was all a dream? <laughs> Did they even sleep a wink? at all? I mean, you know they said to themselves, no one's going to believe us, right? <laughs> but the family that was there did, and they certainly did. And well, <laughs> we do. Do you think those shepherds ever saw Mary and Joseph again? Did they get to see Jesus again? I mean, there's no telling, only retelling this perennial story with new eyes, budding curiosity, and fresh questions. If I've learned anything from those searching shepherds, 
It's that the opposite of fear is not courage. For courage is a positive reaction to fear, and courage sets us on the path to overcoming our fears. The opposite of fear at the end of a courageous adventure is joy. The shepherds return from their pastoral visit in joyful jubilation because what God's messenger told them was true, even if it was frighteningly unexpected. But isn't that how God often works to redeem us and to redeem the world? Don't be so surprised. Amen.